So welcome everybody to the uh, Lenox Board of Selectmen meeting, February 15th. It's now 6 o'clock and it's our regular meeting. So no announcements from the chair at this point in time. And I'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes of February 1st. I move to approve the minutes from Fe the February 1st meeting of the Lenox Select Board. I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So now we have the Citizens Open Forum. Does anybody like to chat with us before we get started on our regular uh, agenda? Yes. Okay. Uh, th this gentleman was first, so why don't you come on up. Or you stand by the microphone. Yeah. Uh, my name is Arthur Oliver, and I live at 35 Greenwood Street here in Lenox. And uh, I've been in Lenox for about 31 years, working as a member of the great artistic community that we have here. Um, what I want to speak about is my extreme frustration with the town on the allowance of so many short-term rentals, which I am sure outweigh the amount of long-term rentals available here in town. I was evicted along with five other people um, at the end of the moratorium in 2020. Uh, I struggled to find housing. Um, most everyone else had to leave Lenox along obviously with their tax dollars um, and uh, it, was a, it was a pretty hard downsize for me and now I watch more and more property being purchased solely for the use of converting it to Airbnbs. The yellow building on the corner of Main and Housatonic Street being the latest example where two friends of mine, long-standing artists and well-known members of this community, are being evicted after 27 years of residency in that building. My issue, my question to you is, I know that there is a, uh, a bylaw passed requiring that no more than 75 days in the year be allowed for rentals. That's great, but I am also aware that there is absolutely no one here on staff to consciously and consistently monitor this. So it's basically on the honor system. What can we do? Is there anything we can do? I, I do see that it's kind of, you can't roll back the clock. You can't turn back and, and tell these people who have invested in this community, but you have lost so many people and you're close to losing more. If I didn't find the very small apartment by faith, by magic, you know, um, I was ready to pack my car and drive back to my home state of Alabama and say, you're welcome for 30 years. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for coming up and bringing that to our attention. Uh, I think Mary Beth can probably, she works very closely with housing in the community, but I mean, I understand what you're saying, and, and, and we, we uh, it, I'm not passing the buck, but it is a zoning issue, and the zoning is in charge of, if I'm not mistaken anyway, is in charge of, of, of policing that because it is a bylaw. Uh, this is the first that I've heard a comment such as yours honestly um, not that people have have not been evicted or have had to move out of town because because of uh, what you're saying but uh, the 75 days and the policing I don't know you know I wasn't aware of that so yeah I've, I've spoken to mr. Oliver oh, you have. for a number a number of times we we go back a few years mm -hmm. um, I had the pleasure of working with him when I was at Shakespeare and Company He's an excellent costume designer um, and I feel very strongly that people like you should be in the community and should be able to find affordable housing in the community. Um, it was not my favorite thing in the world that um, we came up with the 75 day by right and the 110 day by special permit, but that is what the town passed um, for a bylaw at town meeting a few years ago. I am engaged as the chairman of the Affordable Housing Trust in trying to get additional 
new construction rental housing built in the town of Lenox. There is a developer, Penrose LLC, that currently has an application in with the State Department of Housing and Community Development to build 65 new units up next to the courtyard by Marriott um, at Brushwood Farms. We should hear about that particular application this summer um, and find out if they've won financing to build those units. Um, if and when we win that financing, or Penrose wins that financing, there will be 65 new units of housing built um, within about 15 months, so they will be available for rental, hopefully, in mid-2025, if all goes well. And the only other thing that I can comment on is um, I don't know, other than Airbnb uh, having, you know, income markers or collection markers for taxes, I don't know how we have any teeth with regard to enforcing that 75 days. I could, would certainly be happy to research that, find that out through the planning board, because the planning board um, is the organization that develops the bylaws. And so um, with the planning board and with speaking to the zoning board, I will try to find out what's going on and um, I'll come back with a report to the select board in the next couple of weeks and let you know what the teeth are. Great, great, great. That's super. Um, because, you know, and that's nice that 15 months would be a nice fast time to have that done. Um, but I, I just wanted to voice my concern and frustration about the now and the, the prior time to this. And I, I feel as if the town has turned its back on not just me, but many, many others. Mm -hmm. My friend who is living on uh, in a small apartment in town because she wanted to keep her daughter in the Lennox school system for her senior year. The mother sleeps behind a folding screen here in the middle of town, behind a folding screen in her kitchen slash living room while the daughter has the bedroom. That is shameful. Shameful. So, thank you. I know you're not really wanting this to be highly interactive, but I, it, it raises questions for me too because was it three years ago, like the spring meeting, annual town meeting, when we had the, the large, the planning board had come up with the bylaws and short term rentals was the hot button issue and it was debated and, and all that. And, you know, personally, I share your sentiments. I, I wish we hadn't given so much leeway. But it was, you know, their collective efforts and subject to the town vote that got us to where we got to. But I thought we had to have anybody, even if for a day or a weekend or anything, register with the town if their spot was so, so VRBO or Airbnb or anything like that. So they're all required to register with the uh, Commonwealth and uh, <clears throat> every quarter. Um, we uh, get a report uh, from from the Department of Revenue. Uh, so there's two things at work here. If, if folks are um, exceeding the 75-day uh, limit, um, that's certainly something that our zoning enforcement officer, uh, who's uh, Matthew Comer, can uh, investigate um, to the extent we suspect that's happening. Um, in a specific instance, of course. Well, can we? Um, and 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 um, to the extent that there's any uh, rental going on at all that's not taking place at one of those registered sites, um, we would obviously uh, require cease and desist. So, yeah, I, I hate the notion that we're turning our backs because I think, although the vote didn't. Uh, enact bylaws that I personally thought were great. I mean, that's what the, the town wanted at the time that we did it. But it feels like somehow in our system of tracking and other things that we're not, we don't have any, we don't have any teeth. We don't have any active measures that we can take. It's more like we hear about it after the fact by what we get from the state. You know, can, and, and I don't know the answer to this. I'm not gonna suggest that you do something tonight because I, I don't know what it is, but I mean, 
and you're thinking about can, can we do something where we're more proactively monitoring that. And I also thought those bylaws had some component of um, weren't there different standards for live here and then rent for a period of time versus purely investor owned not even any intention of ever living in the property i thought we i thought yeah, there I thought was something that along the lines that was aimed to prevent that type of thing right there, well, there 75 days by right and 110 days which i personally would presume an investor owner would apply for a special permit to have that 110 days to make it more financially feasible for them to purchase the property and then I hear that but I thought there was a local content component to the bylaw where we were tr we're aiming at we're, I, I seem to remember that we felt like we're not going to tell a family who's primarily all grown up and moved out and they have extra buildings that they can't su support themselves with extra income by renting their places yeah. mm -hmm. but we were kind of against Hey, here's a house. So instead of a local buying it, you know, an investor from some LLC somewhere in New York or whatever buys it, and with the only intent of turning it into essentially a hotel in Lenox. I thought we were trying to aim against that. That's exactly what we were. What, what the bylaw was intended to do was to limit the number of days to 110 and make it financially infeasible to support that, you know, kind of investment. But I don't know that that has or hasn't. And, and, uh, I'll wrap this up very quickly, but do you find that the town has benefited from this by having so many uh, spaces that sit empty outside of a 75 days? You know, you walk around and you look at the uh, former apartments and it's empty, empty, you know, um, above some of our eateries, some of our restaurants. Um, how is that serving the town? It's, well, I mean, we know that there are fewer people of uh, late high school age that are even el eligible to work in town. A lot of vendors that are in town complain that they don't have summer help because there aren't as many students in town that can, you know, help during the summertime. So there are fewer families with younger children that grow through the system, which is, you know, what we're trying to do. We're trying to provide housing for younger families and or people who are trying to downsize, get out of their big homes, move to smaller homes, open those larger homes up for people who do have children. But then in the interim, you know, the less expensive properties have, you know, to a degree been purchased by investor owners and being turned into Airbnbs. Yes. We can't, as the town, we don't have control over the private market, so the private market is going to do what they're going to do, and we're trying to circumvent that by having this 75-day buy right, 110-day special permit, and trying to build new rental housing that is only available to owner-occupants. So that's right. what we're trying to do. Yeah, I understand. Thank and I, I, I was not, um, myself, not active or even aware of this potential problem when the, the words of Airbnb first came on the scene, until it happened to me. That's right. So I bear my own share of, of this as a, as a longstanding uh, member of the Lennox community. So I'm uh, not throwing it all at the city, you know, because we work as one. Well, we I, should work I as one. I appreciate you bringing these concerns to us and, um, you know, bringing them to light publicly. Like I said, I know we've talked about it, but it's good that people hear that this is going on and, and it is an issue. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Okay, I think Courtney, you are next. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. And I just, I do want to support what Arthur just said about the housing um, and also, you know, not knowing about things until it happens to you. And that's what happened with us with the cell tower. Um, my house on Alma Street, I can see a cell tower out my back window. I lived with it for 15 years. Never had a single problem. Cell tower is built outside my side door, 450 feet, and we were displaced. And I have neighbors, this is their second winter, living in their car. I have a neighbor who's sleeping in a metal shed behind her daughter's house because that's the only place where she doesn't have symptoms. Um, 
So that's not what I was here to talk to you about, but sometimes things that we think are good have unintended consequences that we just simply don't know about until it happens to us. And that's why we come here before you and ask you for your help. Um, so sorry if I like break up because it's very emotional. Um, tonight, I'm here again to ask you to send the letters uh, to our local delegation of legislators in the FCC. Um, I've been asking for a few months now. Um, the reason is simple, and tonight I won't even tell you in my own words. I'm gonna tell you in the words of the Berkshire Eagle. They wrote a February 10th opinion piece called More Local Debate on 5G Signal Fact Finding and Guidance from State Legislators. Um, I'm gonna read from it now. As we've noted, some cell tower opponents have a point. I don't like the word cell tower opponent. I would say somebody who was injured and has a medical diagnosis of harm from one. But as wireless technologies, capabilities, and presence have expanded, the regulatory framework around them has not. Agencies like the FCC and telecom giants like Verizon point to operational rules developed in the previous millennium before mobile devices and wireless infrastructure were as ubiquitous and advanced as they are now. That must change, and our state and federal leaders should see the need for that update as their municipal counterparts continue to trip over these wires. Legislation previously filed on Beacon Hill could kickstart this necessary exploratory mission. In its last two sessions, bills that would establish the state 5G technology task force have languished, but that is just what the situation demands. The most recent version of the bill would create a blue ribbon committee bringing together lawmakers, regulators, state tech officials, and business representatives to review the current state of the wireless communications regulation and recommend relative, relevant updates on the 5G era. <coughs> While these last two bills were sent to die in a study order, we hope that lawmakers, especially our Berkshire delegates, seeing more of their communities entrenched in these debates would see the benefit of pursuing such legislation in this new session. Now, it goes on. Now, we came to you early on in the piece while our legislators were still working on writing those bills um, so they could hear your voices, just like Pittsfield and other towns have sent those letters in. Now our legislators are working on which bills to champion and it's really important that they hear from you that this is something that people have turned up meeting after meeting and said we want better communication. Everybody deserves to be able to use their cell phone and make a call and have that for them in an emergency or for a work situation. But they also need to know that they're protected. And with antiquated 1996 standards, we simply aren't. And there's nobody here to answer those questions. So last night there was a planning board meeting. I went, they talked about the letters. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, I think let them do if they wanna write separate letters. We're asking you guys as our select board um, to take those letters and to send them off and to let people like Smitty and Trisha, um, you know, our new senator, know that this is uh, something that we would like them to support these new bills that we have championed. Please champion them along with us. Thank you. I'll try to answer your questions as best I can, or, or your your comments uh, quickly, because we've got to keep we've got a long meeting. But are we in a position to write a letter? Yes, and we are. And is it planning board? I don't know about the planning board, but I do know this: that we want to have consensus, and we want to get together with the planning board so we don't have two different letters going out under town Lennox, uh, letterhead. We have, Chris has established contact with the planning board and we have every intention of getting together with them very shortly and solidifying a letter that the town in fact will send. And that's all I'm gonna be able to say to you. We are working on it and I appreciate your, 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 your consistency of bringing it up to our attention. And uh, we wanna get something out but we don't wanna get two things out that, ha that may look a little different. Absolutely, and okay. I thank you so much for your, your dedication and your care and just your updates. I mean, I think that's all that feels really important is just to know where we are in the process okay. of it, and thank you for letting me know it is in process. I okay. appreciate it. All right, Courtney, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I think I would, I would echo, I mean, we unanimously agreed that we wanted to send a letter, but we yes. also felt technically, I don't want to say inept, but technically challenged in terms of knowing the right questions to ask and the right things to say, so we asked the planning board to help us with the letter. Right. I'd like that to happen a little quicker, but that's where we are right now. 
Yeah, I don't know fully if the planning board understands like the intention of the letter because we, when we speak, we don't speak to the planning board about the letters. And so last night I kind of heard a little bit of information like, you know, oh, there was this FCC lawsuit and are we joining with it? Are we like, and it was like, whoa, like it got so big. Like there was this confusion around it. And I just wanted to clarify that the only thing the letters are, and it started from the governor of Wyoming, and then other towns have taken this letter and have shared it on behalf of their constituents, um, is just to simply say, please pay attention to this issue. Um, you know, doctors are diagnosing people with injury due to non-ionizing radiation, and we need help with those answers. It's not to engage in litigation or anything like that, and I, I Maybe I should, would you recommend me speaking to the planning board about the purpose of those letters and helping to clarify it? There just seems to be some misinformation or confusion. I mean, they're, they're their own elected body. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, you're certainly free to speak to them. I'm not going to recommend that you do, but mm -hmm. that's, that's certainly up to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else for Citizens Open Forum? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, my name is Daniel Schenker. I live on 13 Bolton Drive. Uh, at the town meeting that we had last November, there was a noise ordinance that was passed. And uh, my understanding was that that was sort of a uh, sort of an interim measure because of issues involving uh, enforcement. And I had a follow-up conversation some time ago with Chris about this, and I just was wondering uh, what uh, work was being done on uh, an advanced noise ordinance at this point. Okay, Chris, you really have to help me out here. Yeah, sure. I mean, at the, at the staff level, we're uh, continuing to take, um, you know, model um, bylaws in towns, ordinances, and cities um, that would be uh, usefully applicable uh, to the town. I, admittedly, as we discussed, the uh, the bylaw that was passed at the special town meeting was, you know, really about as general a framework as you could you you could get um you know given the uh the resources that are that are required for uh enforcement you know sh short of you know purchasing um uh, what are those things called Decibles. Decibles, right <laughs> sound meters and um but that that being said uh there, there has to be a battle it, it was a it was an appropriate stopgap measure um, but there, there has to be a, uh, a, a better solution out there than the one. So we, we, we did something, and we're continuing to work to see what we can do better. Okay. That's fine. I just, it just inquired at this point because right. one, I moved here a couple of years right. ago, and the winters are wonderful because they're so quiet. Yeah. But in a couple of months, we're going to get into the like leaf blower season again. And, oh, yeah. Um, well, yeah. we have many snowblowers, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't hear snowblowers so much, but it's, it, but it's, it's the leaf blowers yeah. that are really the issue. Yeah. So. Okay, uh, I appreciate that. Okay. But so next time, instead of catching us off guard, send a letter, and then Mary Ellen will pass well, it all well, we, to us. We, we, we've, we've, we, we've we talked about this, and I, yeah, I'm, right. I'm, yeah. I'm a, I, I and staff are aware that it is a thing that we have to do a, a okay. better job on. We, again, we did the best we could getting up to November, but we know we need to do better moving forward. Right, and it's much appreciated. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, anybody else for Citizens Open Forum? Hello, Sonia Bykovsky, 225 Main Street. Okay. Um, I'd like to echo what he said because Casella picked up garbage at 4.30 in the morning the other day. I was not planning to speak to that, but wow, was it loud. What day, um, what day was that? Uh, I can tell you because it's on my phone. I have a picture on my phone, and it was at the Keters, around the back that of the Keters is, um, uh, property. I can tell you that, so I'm happy okay. to look it up for you. Um, they, um, I do know Casella sent like an all-town communication on, I think, Wednesday that because of the storm, things are going to be delayed until Thursday. And I don't know, and this is why we're still work in progress on this, whether they have the ability to invoke, you know, emergency weather conditions just as like we kept that bylaw with the ability to deploy construction crews to an emergency road failure or something like that outside of working hours I don't know whether they qualify for that or not and, yeah. and it, that's why there's so many wrinkles to the whole thing yeah, yeah. I, okay. I know you you all said you were going to contact Casella and have a 
casual conversation with them at some point anyway. So, um, so I wanted to come before you and ask you, I had come to you for a bunch of meetings and brought up my uh, concerns over the um, communication issues kind of getting more less strong <laughs> between the town and citizens. I wanted to ask if you would put communications on your next March 1 meeting agenda so I can tell you the specifics and just discuss that once and for all and, and maybe come up with things that will make that clearer. Well, you know, you have the right to ask us to be on the agenda for sure. We'll, we'll coordinate with Chris as to what agenda we get you on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And also I know uh, town elections and things are coming up. I know Carrie sent out an um, email with some of the um, boards with positions. Um, I wanted to, and that's great by the way, awesome. Um, I wanted to ask, there are other boards with other openings that were not listed on there. Uh, I think Con... She, she listed the elected positions. Yeah, so, so... We always have openings on boards. Yeah. Right, so, okay. But since we're sending out the, the message about the elected boards, I thought, I was talking to somebody on the Conservation Commission the other day who said they've had an opening for like a year. And, I, and she said, but nobody wants to run. And I said, but I didn't know about it. So what I was going to suggest is, if you could also send one mailing to the town email list with just all the openings on all the committees right now so that anybody who actually is willing to step up has the uh, opportunity because they know about it. I actually, I'm going to speak to this a little bit. I stand up at every town meeting, special or otherwise, with do. the sign-up sheet that says, if you're willing to do any of these things, please fill this out. It's in every town report. Mm -hmm. Give it to Mary Ellen. She keeps a file folder of them. And if, you know, if there are people who are showing up at town meeting who are interested or they're engaged in any way, shape, or form, that form is available to everyone. It's always in the town um, report, and it's always with Carrie downstairs. So yeah. anybody who wants to do anything for the town can come in at any time and volunteer their services. Yeah. And Mary Ellen Collins. Yeah, I filled those in. All the Great. openings and vacancies are also at all times on the website. Yes, they are. Yep. Okay. And, and again, and it's different when you get uh, something in your face that just says, here, we're looking, we have these openings, rather than people who don't have a prompt going to look for it. So, and I filled those in, and I'm willing to help. Terrific. I have not been called upon for that yet. Thank you. Um, but, you know, so that's, again, just if one email just saying, here are the openings. Um, that also reaches everyone, not just people at town meeting. And but I do, I do always notice you do that, Mary Beth. So okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so we're going to move ahead. I gave Sonia four minutes. Did we get everybody? Yeah. Thank you. And some of that was the trash. That wasn't mine. <laughs> thank you, Dick. Okay. Anybody else want to say anything while we're here? All right, we'll move on. So. Next on the agenda is the consent agenda. The We're going to stall agenda. a couple of them, so go ahead. Yes, okay, we have a one-day wine and malt license request. Jillian Pastori is seeking a one-day wine and malt license for a birthday party on Saturday, February 25th from 4 to 11 p.m. at Venford Hall. A certified bartender will be present. Uh, Arlene Schiff's term on the Lennox Cultural Council is up, and there is an appointment um, expiring in June, she is recommending that the board appoint Gabriella Sheehan so that the council will have the required five members on the council. We have several requests to use Lilac Park. The chamber is seeking permission to use Lilac Park on June 10th and 11th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. for the spring art walk. September 9th and 10th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. for the fall art walk. September 15th through the 17th from noon to 6 p.m. for the Jazz Stroll. I'll hold and, that one. Thank you. And September 23rd from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. for Apple Squeeze. The Community Center is also seeking permission to use Lilac Park on Saturday, April 8th from 10 a.m. to 12 noon for their annual Easter Egg Scramble. We have a donation acceptance from Darlene McCauley of the Community Center. Of, to accept a monetary donation and a solicitation request from Trinity Solar to gain our permission to go door to door distributing information about state and centers incentives for solar projects. Oh. 
that we have a hold on that. The gentleman is here this evening and um, will answer any questions we may have. Okay, so let's let's get rid of the every, everything without a hold, okay? So let's get a motion for that, get that out of the way. Okay, great. A mission, um, I have a motion for everything except the... Um, Chamber jazz stroll and solar. Thank you. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye. okay. So let's take yours first, your first Yeah. Poll. So uh, Jen Nacht had written to Mary Ellen uh, recently and she asked to update the times for the jazz stroll. I, she, she doesn't reference date change, so I'm assuming this is the same date, just it's starting at 11 as opposed to noon, sound company, first bands, first performance at one, and then the end time is 7 p.m. Fantastic. That's Thank the you. only modification. Great. Okay. So you want to go ahead and... Um, do you want to approve that one and then we'll go to the next fold? Yeah. Do that. Okay. Uh, I move to approve that change for the jazz stroll. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So we have the solicitation request from Trinity Solar. Are you, are you here? To, you're the gentleman here to talk to us about that? I am here to talk about that. So, hello everybody, it's very nice to meet you guys. I had spoke to Mary Ellen on the phone. My name is Xavier Conway, hello everybody. Um, so I know as soon as solar comes up, I know exactly what everybody starts to think. Guy coming to your door to pitch you to buy a new product. Not out here for that. I'm simply in the area identifying homes that could potentially qualify for a new no cost program. Nobody's paying into this program. Everybody unfortunately already pays into this program. We've been mandated for the last year and a half to pay taxes on our electric bill. So I simply go around, see whose homes get a lot of sun, who's already paying a lot on their electric bill, and just find better times for homeowners to get free information about what's possible for the future. And so I talked to Mary Ellen on the phone that evening. She had advised me that we have a lot of retirees in the area, and the real issue was just communication, letting you guys know which hours, which streets, exactly how I was going to be maneuvering throughout the town of Lennox. So I'm willing to be able to cooperate, you know, whichever... Um, routes you guys would like me to take, whether it's knocking until a certain hour, until dark, I'm willing to move whatever route, but I just want to let the town of Lennox know that, uh, put a face, you know, a humanizing face to the goal of just simply letting people know, I know you have National Grid out here, I live in Housatonic, my bill recently went up, um, a lot of homeowners in Housatonic and Great Barrington as well as bills have increased, so simply just distributing free information and finding better times for them to get free information about how they can actually take advantage of it. So, not to... Buy anything, simply just for information. It's up into the homeowner's hands if they would like to move forward with it. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for coming by. I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity. All right. to. You're not going to like the rest of my... <laughs> <laughs> we we have, unfortunately have a no-knock policy in town, okay. which means we don't approve solicitations door to door. We do try to encourage and help you in any other way of making our, our residents informed as to what you have to offer them, whether it be through a mailing and offer you a mailing list of our residents, the, the homeowners, or, or some other thing. But our, I've got to explain this. We have the no-knock policy for a couple of reasons. We have a lot of old people living here. I understand. All right. The second knock, the cops get a call. <laughs> All right. That's, and that's usually how we're made aware of a door-to-door -door solicitation is through something like that. You're nice enough to come and present your your product to us and what you're going to do. And, and I don't think there's one of us here that wouldn't want to hear what you have to offer. However, I'm going to hear, you're, we're going to hear from it by another means other than a knock. Okay. Okay. Do you want to add to this? I, I think it might be a great idea if maybe you got in touch with Darlene McCauley at the community center and set up some, she's the director of the community. Oh, that's a great center. idea. And you could Darlene. set up a time to um, make yourself available, say between 12 and noon, um, you know, on a Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday. Um, if you guys, I know you guys do uh, some aerial, you know, uh, plans of localities. And if you could say, you know, on Monday, I'll talk about streets in the village. On Wednesday, I'll talk about streets in Lennoxdale. And on Friday, I'll talk about streets in North Lennox. Um, and if you want to come to an informational session, I can give you more information. <coughs> and they can send that out <coughs> via um, you know, community stuff that we have. In that, that's a good idea. Yeah. That's a great idea. So it's Darlene, D-A-R-L-E-N-E, Macaulay, M, little c, capital C, A-L. 
A U L E Y. Gotcha. So I had it correct. I wanted to make sure I had it right. Yeah. Okay. And you'll be able to find if you just Google Lennox Community Center or Town of Lennox, she's going to be somewhere in there that you'll be okay. able to email or call her. All righty. Well, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Well, good luck. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. If, if everyone was like you, probably wouldn't have to have this. Name that <laughs> yeah, no, I was right. Uh, okay. we, what, do we no, need? we don't have to do anything. Okay. We're not going to prove it. All right. Okay. Super. So we can move on to uh, general business. And okay. we've got a public hearing. Okay. So we have a public hearing. Um, as the clerk, I'm going to read the legal notice as it appeared in the Berkshire Eagle. The Town of Lenox Notice of Public Hearing. The Select Board will hold the annual public hearing for the setting of water and sewer rates for fiscal year 24 on Wednesday, February 15th, 2023 at 6 p.m. in the Select Board's meeting room, Town Hall, 6 Walker Street, Lenox, Massachusetts. All persons wishing to comment shall be afforded an opportunity to be heard. Dave Roach, Chair. Um, Do you need to move to open Yes, it? and now I will move to open the public hearing. Second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, our public hearing is now open. We'll hear testimony from our town manager, I believe. Sure. So, um, just as by way of background for folks that are less familiar, the, um, uh, the water and sewer regs require that every February the board holds its public hearing on, uh, on rates for those uh, residents on either uh, public water or public wastewater system or, or both in, in most cases in the town. Uh, so I'll start with the good news first. Um, the, the water fund, the water enterprise fund is doing very well this year. Um, and uh, we see for yet another year no reason to uh, raise rates. And in fact, we have some encouraging developments moving forward where we're seeing uh, some of our previous debt um, uh, being retired. Um, so that will free up some additional headroom where we feel confident that we'll be able to pursue our aggressive capital program um, without uh, you know, undue pressure on, on rates. Um, the bad news is, and not entirely unrelated to the, uh, to the wastewater treatment plant upgrade that was approved at town meeting uh, in, in the fall, the uh, wastewater rates do need to increase. Uh, our, our, by our analysis, we're running about, uh, at a, about a 9% uh, deficit if we don't make any changes just for normal operations and, and debt ser service. And then in the, uh, in, the, in the case of the debt service stabilization account that we told town meeting we would establish um, before, before we issue permanent bonds, we're looking at about a 4% uh, increase attributable to that. So what I've presented in a tabular format for you is a, um, uh, a rate scenario that uh, with the current rates on water of $8.22, that's a $205.50 bill on a relatively typical uh, account of 25,000 gallons of consumption. We're pr not proposing to change that at all. So that would be a 0% uh, impact. Uh, on the wastewater side, the recommendation is 13%. Uh, that would take it from a 12.7, I'm sorry, $12.70 per thousand gallons of consumption up to $14.35. And that would uh, result in a $41.27 uh, rate, or I'm sorry, dollar increase on, on, on the bill. Uh, if you, since almost everyone in town, with the exception of you know, fewer than a dozen count, accounts, uh, everyone is, who's on wastewater is also on water. So the, the blue bill that you get in the mail, the bottom line, which is what everyone typically uh, looks to, is going to be a $41.27 increase in aggregate because it's, again, zero on water. Um, and that's for, that's for 25,000 gallons of, of, of consumption. <laughs> okay, I was about to leave in with sort of a soft shoe comment. Just hand it over, Dave. Um, I've talked, you know, 
extensively with folks about this. Billy, as recently as a couple hours ago, Superintendent Goff, I should say. Um, you know, factors affecting our wastewater treatment costs are a partially attributable to the fact that we don't process our sludge and other things as well as we should, given the new regulations, which is the whole genesis of wanting to upgrade the plant, which we got approval for in November. The cost of sludge disposal has skyrocketed in past past couple years in particular, but it, I mean, it far outpaces what you'd expect for normal growth because options of what to do with it are fewer and fewer. So that's hurting us. Um, as you know, we send a component of our waste to Pittsfield by the uh, New Lenox Road pump station, and Pittsfield has increased its rates at a pre-escalated level uh, to the town for the water, you know, the waste to be sent in their direction. And I know it's a conversation for way down the road in the future, but I think given that we're invested in our, investing in our wastewater treatment facility and it is sized to take all of Lenox wastewater, just that we don't have the piping in town to get it all to our wastewater treatment facility, but as as you can read about in the newspaper, or as we know, Pittsfield's having some trouble with their plan right now. And we're seeing, I think, that reflected in what they're charging us for that component. So it does seem like an extreme rate increase even prior to us getting the new plant or the upgraded plant online. But I would say Pittsfield's fees to us and sludge disposal are probably the biggest drivers. Yeah, after having attended the Mass Municipal Association Conference in Boston a couple of weeks ago um, and sitting in on the wastewater treatment forum, um, we listened to uh, the gentleman who's the wastewater manager for Haverhill. <coughs> and um, he informed everyone in the room that sludge waste treatment was $86 a ton about two years ago. It's $120 a ton now, and they expect next year to go to $175 a ton. And they dispose of 14,000 tons of sludge every year. So um, I think that having an increase of 4%, which we were informed of at town meeting, and everyone understood that we're going to be building this wastewater treatment plant, and the town voted to in fact issue bonds for the wastewater treatment plant um, and that we were going to be getting ourselves into a stabilization situation. I think that the town's been made aware of this. I think this is a very solid explanation that we're going from 9% to 13% to develop this stabilization fund. Um, and I, I echo what Neil has said that I think this needs to be done to be responsible. All right, I, I agree. I said tongue in cheek that he was the expert, and he is the expert. I mean, he uh, uh, brings a lot of knowledge to this board. I, I agree. I mean, it's it's going up. I had priced have it on my own septic tank pumped, and that price has gone sky high. So, for probably the same reason, they have to dispose of it as well. So nobody's escaping this, and it's uh, sort of like the. Our health insurance, it's a wild card. You just never know what's what's going to happen, although this is consistently going up. It is, and it's the state of affairs in wastewater treatment right now that everybody's facing, and sadly, we're facing these escalating costs at the same time that we were issued our new permit that we can't meet the requirements of until we make an upgrade to the plant. So you're seeing both things happen to aggregate to this, this large increase, but Thinking back to the math that I think you presented, I, I know you presented it to us in the Permanent Building Committee, but I think we presented it to uh, town as well. The 4% that Chris is talking about, this the component that's sort of setting up the stabilization fund to pay for the building upgrades so that we can eventually long-term bond them. That part um, will eventually reverse, and we'll see that increase um, eventually decrease. Right. So the, the ultimate effect on, on ratepayers will will right. turn around at some point. Yeah. The the nine percent that comes from operating costs today, we can't do anything about. No. Anything else you want to add to this? Well 
I'm, I see, yeah. see so, by your expression. Yeah. The well, um, yes. yeah, thank, thank you. I, I, I mean, it's, um, you know, it never feels good to make that kind of a recommendation, but it's warranted for all the reasons that have already been stated. Um, you know, we had we had a very good run with the with the wastewater fund. We've you know we've not exceeded you know two and a half percent in any year that that I've been town manager, and those those years are are adding up. Um, so, but you know, now's the time um, where we, where we have to uh, start. Uh, digging in and grappling with some of these cross pressures, and unfortunately, that will hit the ratepayers. Um, there are a couple of uh, additional uh, changes that uh, that Superintendent Gop and uh, the finance team have, have recommended, um, raising the the minimum uh, wastewater charge from thirty dollars, thirty five dollars to fifty dollars. So it's a fifteen dollar uh, bill on the minimum bill. You know, we don't we don't. Is that an annual? Yeah, we, we'll, right. We don't, we don't, uh, semi-annual. Semi the, um, we don't, we don't charge metering uh, below 5,000 gallons. So if you're hitting 5,000 gallons, you know, there's, there's sort of the minimum ante to uh, be a part of the system. Um, and the, um, the, the $50 on the, uh, on the, on the sewer charge and the $40 on the, on the water charge uh, up from 35, so it's a $5 increase on the water charger, basically uh, designed to more or less mimic the, uh, the, the, the rate application to the $5,000, uh, or I'm sorry, 5,000 gallon um, uh, minimum threshold. Have you ever changed those in a while, have you? No. No. Well, it's, it's, it's pennies a day. It's, it's like 350 a month. For the minimum, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's. Uh, I mean, I, I don't like I don't like strangling our residents at all. But I mean, but but we need to do this, and it's three dollars and fifty cents a month. It's it's not a lot of money. Okay. That that's I'm not saying that that's not true. I, but I do think, <clears throat> as much as this might need to be down the road, that. Um, you know, we're, we, we have underway design of the upgrades to the plant, and they are primarily to meet phosphorus regulations right. and nitrogen regulations that we can't meet. We don't have the technology to do it. But in some ways, though it wasn't the primary goal, it will um, reduce our sludge quantities. As we undergo this process, and we, if we keep seeing this happen to sludge, we may ask um, TP associates to think harder about how can we do even more to reduce sludge quantities. And maybe it's time to start thinking about what we're sending north to Pittsfield and being able to handle it ourselves long term. Because I don't like to constantly have these small sort of nicks and cuts at the ratepayers happening time after time. And, you know, I'd like to be able to be more in control of our costs than we are long term. I agree. Agreed. Yeah. Um, I, I should also mention, uh, Ed called me earlier to talk about this since he's very familiar with it on, on the upgrade side. and He concurred with your recommendations. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds good. All right. So, uh, so it's a public hearing, so I've, I've, I've done my part. Right. Right. I don't know if the, I would move to I don't, well, I, I don't know if the public has. Oh, okay. oh anybody here from the public want to talk about the sludge? <laughs> <laughs> Wastewater <laughs> in general, <laughs> water rates in general. All right. Okay. Great. Thank then you. I would move to close the public hearing. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 So and now I will move to approve the water rate of eight dollars and twenty-two cents per thousand gallons of water in a sewer rate of $14.35 per thousand gallons, and further, to set the minimum usage charge to $40 for water and $50 for sewer. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, and thank Superintendent Gopp for his work on this. Mm -hmm. on uh, I, will, I do want to give a, a credit to uh, Deanna Garner. Okay. From the DPW, uh, Charlie Brown, our town accountant, 
and uh, Brenda Mara, our town treasurer, and, um, and Mary Ellen Deming for all the, uh, the analysis that went into it. So I think we got it as, I, I as low as we responsibly could work. as a result it. of that uh, team effort. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So does either of my colleagues have anything else they'd like to discuss? Not this evening. Uh, I'll just say that uh, I know you're going to tell the folks when we're meeting next, there will be a permanent building committee meeting that same night. Um, the permanent building committee has now under contract both um, Jim Hannafin for the safety complex and Dave Prickett from DP Associates, Hannafin from Kalo Beanick, that is, um, they are now actively at work on designs for <coughs> projects and um, I also can report that the um, the revised approach to the library dome restoration has interested bidders. We should oh, have we should have bids in hand good. by two weeks from today. So um, all the money that we talked about getting in, in November is already at work. All right, great. Excellent. Okay, thanks, Neil. Uh, so before I adjourn, I'll say that our next regular meeting is Wednesday, March 1st at 6 o'clock. And now I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn tonight's meeting. Second. In favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.